I think if we already have a good number of people, we might as well get started then. Uh, that'll give more time for discussion later, which is always fascinating. So uh, I'm Tess Joles. I'm president of the Center for Media Literacy, and I'm really thrilled to be here this evening. Uh, this is the third of a three-part series that we've had on media literacy as a national defense strategy. And uh, this evening, I'm really proud and pleased to be able to introduce Michelle Johnson. And uh, Michelle uh, owns her own company, Ignite Global Good, which is an affiliate of the Center for Media Literacy. And uh, uh, Michelle was really our first affiliate. And uh, uh, I'll never meeting, I'll never forget meeting her in a coffee shop in Northridge, California, <laughs> which turned out to be a very fortuitous meeting. <laughs> and uh, uh, Michelle is a graduate with her master's degree in public diplomacy from the University of Southern California. So she has a really great perspective on this topic and um, one that I know is valued in major organizations because, for example, in NATO, the media literacy efforts are pretty much centered in the uh, uh, Department for Public Diplomacy. So, Michelle, I'll let you take it from here, but really glad to be here. Thank you. And thanks for everyone being here. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Tessa. And we can go ahead and start the slideshow, which is in Yonti's capable hands. Here we go. So we're going to talk about media literacy at, as public diplomacy. Just a few things I want to say uh, up front is some of this is centered on the United States. I know we have uh, participants from around the world so I want to be sensitive to that. And in the discussion groups, if you are hearing things where you, um, that are possibly different or the same, bring in your own perspectives. I think that exchange is so important. Um, so go ahead and flip to the next slide. Uh, so Tessa went over a little bit about who I am. My company, Ignite Global Good, is a strategic communications, public relations and marketing company. So I come from a long background as a message maker. Uh, so that's my perspective, as well as a human rights advocate. Uh, my master's degree is in public diplomacy from USC, uh, Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Uh, so that's basically what qualifies me to bring these two worlds together, the two worlds that I love. Uh, I am an affiliate for Center for Media Liter Literacy. You heard from Tessa Joles. She is a modern pioneer of media literacy, uh, exceptional, exceptional work. Uh, and I'm so proud to be a part of her, her organization, be affiliated with it. I'm also a media literacy trainer and workshop leader. So I've been doing that since about 2017. Um, and one, uh, my uh, paper that I co-authored with Tessa is called Media Literacy, a Foundational Skill for 21st Century Democracy. And I thought I'd bring that paper up. It was in the 2018 June, I believe, Hastings Law Journal. And uh, so much of what's in that paper has to do uh, in some way with what we're talking about today. Um, next slide, please. So we come from a diff variety of backgrounds, so I'm going to give a little mini course on what public diplomacy is. And the truth is there are many definitions, but the core concept is that public diplomacy is the way in which international actors advance foreign policy, not by engaging one another, but by engaging with a foreign public. And that is uh, uh, an example, and some examples I'd like to give you are international cultural events, conferences, the Sister Cities Program, if you're aware of what that is, foreign students in study abroad, abroad programs, and visits by international opinion leaders and artists. Um, Essentially, what Tessa is doing is part of public diplomacy, being a visiting scholar from the United States in Brussels. If you think of when uh, countries send their artists to other countries, uh, 
it is a form of public diplomacy. The big thing last night was, oh gosh, I get these initials wrong. BTS, the, the um, K-pop band, sold out a huge uh, stadium in the United States. It's a Korean boy band. So all of these things that, that you know, maybe familiar and maybe you're not thinking of it as public diplomacy, do fall under that umbrella. Uh, next slide, please. So there are different types of public diplomacy and this comes from a book by Nicholas Cole, who's another professor of public diplomacy at USC. The foundation of public diplomacy is listening. You can't create programs that can provide, that, that are effectively influencing publics without listening to who they are, what interests them, what doesn't, uh, learning about those cultures in that way. Um, so all of public diplomacy lays on a found, at least good public diplomacy, lays on, on top of a foundation of listening. And in media literacy, we can compare that to the concept of knowing your audience. Um, advocacy is where the international communication comes in. Think of it as a promotional activity to an, to an international audience. This is where we have international communications and embassy press relations, anything that is advocating. Cultural diplomacy, which is one of my favorites, um, making cultural resources and achievements known overseas. And some of orga an organization that is, is an example that does that is the British Council. Here in Los Angeles, you can take classes in Turkish because the, the Turkish ministries have set that up. Um, other areas of cultural diplomacy, one that I love is food. Some people use the term gastro diplomacy. Some people don't like that term, but anytime you taste the food and share a meal with people from another culture, you're getting, food communicates so much. You, you're getting a taste, not just of the food, but of the culture itself. So, um, cultural diplomacy. Uh, another type is exchange diplomacy. And that's, you, that's basically what Tessa is doing right now. It's sending students and professionals overseas and accepting them in reciprocity for learning and cultural purposes. International broadcasting, uh, that, that the definition of that has expanded. It's the use of technologies such as radio, television, and internet to engage with foreign publics. When you think of Radio Free Europe or Voice of America, the, this is international broadcasting as it applies under public diplomacy. But now we have the internet. So we'll talk more about that, how that has really, uh, that, has, that has expanded things. Now this last one, I created even my slide a little bit of space there because it is adjacent to public diplomacy but some, pe some people do consider it part of it and it's psychological warfare. Now that has, there are different terms for that now, the, the name of, of it is changing, but it is an actor's use of communication to achieve an objective during wartime, usually through direct communication with uh, an enemy, the enemy's public. Um, an example that I, have used in a lot of my studies is back in uh, uh, Voz de la Liberación in, was it an American psychops uh, uh, activity in Guatemala in the 50s to overthrow the Arbenz, uh, the Arbenz um, administration. They created music and very entertaining uh, content that also had pro-American um, pro themes to it. And it was circulated as freedom fighters who were deep in the jungles broadcasting. It was really created by CIA operatives in um, Okalaka, Florida and flying by, flown by night. So that could be considered a, a psychological ops operation and even the most 
the countries that have reputations for the most you know, benevolent countries have some form of this. Uh, next slide, please. So who practices public diplomacy? When you think about traditional diplomacy, you think about actors who are government to government, uh, ministries, embassies, people within the government, a state department. Public diplomacy is in one part, governments directly to foreign publics, but not only that, non-state actors also can practice public diplomacy by communicating with foreign publics. Uh, for example, NGOs. An NGO in one country may want to solve hunger problems or uh, fill medical needs by communicating with a foreign public for donations or participation in programs. There are also malicious actors that are non-state actors that communicate directly to foreign publics. If you think of Al-Qaeda and um, ISIS who communicate directly with foreign publics for recruitment purposes. And um, citizen diplomacy, whether we know it or not, when we communicate with people from foreign lands, we are representing our nation in some way to them. Um, so that could be when you're traveling, it could be when you're studying abroad. Citizen diplomacy, I think that citizen journalism falls under here because we no longer only get our information from uh, gatekeepers, we now also get information. Anybody with a Twitter and account can, or a phone can communicate or write and gather attention. So that is all part of citizen diplomacy. And the next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the United States State Department and what they are doing, some of the things they are doing around media literacy right now. Um, again, those of you from other places who are on the call may have other activities and other information to add about what you, what's happening in your country. But uh, for foreign service officers, those, those uh, diplomats who are posted in countries around the world, the Foreign Service Institute training catalog includes many classes that have media literacy aspects but media literacy itself is not a required discipline. It's included in some other required courses. So I'm thinking to when Monica spoke uh, last time about what's going on in the United States our, um, military branches. I think this is, sounds kind of similar. It's not, it hasn't been created as a specific subject, but it is weaving its way in. Um, the other thing that I found that was really interesting is American Spaces. Now, the Office of American Spaces is part of the Bureau of Educational, Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. State Department. And their purpose is to foster mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people in countries around the globe. Um, and these are actual spaces in other nations where people can come to learn about the United States. They can learn English language. There are topics such as STEM and entrepreneurship that are popular in promoting economic development and developing nations. They learn about American culture, society, the values of the United States, and American Spaces actually has a complete unit on media literacy and countering disinformation, there's a toolkit. Um, so one of the benefits of the uh, of the um, of the American spaces is it allows for direct audience engagement at the core uh, and provides the U.S. government with influential opportunities to counter disinformation while creating a positive impact on how the U.S. is understood and viewed around the world. For example, uh, in the Ukraine and China, American spaces counter disinformation 
with media literacy campaigns and workshops that show journalists, students, and other members of the public how to recognize hoaxes and push back against inaccurate reporting. And um, this Media Literacy and Countering Disinformation Resource Toolkit is designed for programming in the U in the in American spaces, um, but it is also available to the public. It's designed um, to increase participants' awareness of disinformation and their media literacy skills. And it contains things like best practices, links to lesson plans, videos, games, fact checking in news sites and online courses. And if this works for me, I can probably put the link, ah, I did it, in the chat if anyone is interested. And next slide, please. So um, as we go into our uh, breakout groups, uh, the discussion question I want you to think about is, in what other ways do you think that media literacy can make the work of public, public diplomats more effective? And consider governments, non-state actors, NGOs, and citizen diplomats. So we'll, we'll give you, what do you think, Yanti, 10 minutes to discuss this? Or, and then we'll come back and maybe have a few people share what they, what they learned or spoke about. Okay, so I'm going to open it up and then uh, people could uh, move to the uh, breakout room. Here we go. And if you have any issue, let me know. I can assign you to the rooms. So 10 minutes and we'll come back. If anybody has issues getting to your room, let me know. If anybody needs help to move to the room, just let me know and I can help you with that. Philip, Uida, Isabel, Felix, Jonathan, Martina, let me know. Salome, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Um, uh, do you need to be... No. I put you in room number two. Do you see it? Uh, Let me no. try to see here now. Can you see it? Okay, let me see. Martina, do you see the invitation? 
Jonathan. Felix, I don't know if you see. Oh, okay. No problem. So we have six more minutes and then people will join back and we'll continue. Hello. Hi, Sarah, can you hear me? Um, we're in breakout rooms for five more minutes. I'm gonna put you in one. You don't need to join it if you want to. Uh, and then we're coming back um, in, in five minutes. Um, Here you go. So if you want, you can join that.
So everybody's going to join us in 10 seconds. Here we go. So um, I hope everybody had stimulating conversations. And is there anyone who wants to talk about what, yeah, what your group talked about or any insights? Okay. There's one, Kim. You need to unmute. Sorry about that. We, we thought that your question was very interesting in that how can media literacy help diplomats? And, and the question that we kept coming back to was, who do, you, who do you trust? Because there is such a lack of trust. So when even now that somebody's teaching us media literacy, we have to ask ourselves, who is teaching it? And why are they teaching it? And where is it coming from? And it's, it, we didn't come up with a lot of answers. We came up with a lot more questions about how, how is this gonna happen? And somebody asked, where is the red line? between the disinformation and the, the, the question of who's, who's telling this to me. And we were laughing that there, there is no red line anymore. That's a really good point. Um, media literacy teaches people to ask the right questions. That is not a panacea. This is not about risk elimination. It's about risk mitigation. So somebody who is taught to um, taught media literacy, who has that skills, has that edu has those that education, they're not going to be perfect. You can't you don't put a cape, cape on a big S and they can't be fooled. But they are more capable of asking the right questions. And in media literacy, we don't want to be directive and say this is who you trust. We want to teach publics how to ask the right questions and make in the right ways and come up with wise answers for themselves because we're all different. That's not going to be the same for any everybody. Anybody else come up with insights or more questions? Dr. Sieb, would you mind sharing your insight? I thought it was so informed and telling. <laughs> Well, well, my point, and it and it really links into the the comment of a of the person who was talking just when we got cut off and sent yeah. back his name there, is that it's it, both the media diploma media literacy and public diplomacy are both very hard sells uh, to funders, particularly. Uh, you go to the U.S. Congress, for example, or I imagine to parliaments and, and ministries all over the world. And say we want uh, we want money for public diplomacy because we've got this project of bringing young people over to the United States. Let's say, and in twenty years it'll pay off when one of them becomes prime minister. Well, the the funders are going to say, why should we gamble on something twenty years down the road when we could buy, use this money instead to build a nice jet fighter? It could blow up all those people, uh, and, which is sort of the essence of American foreign policy over the years. But it's um, it, it is a hard sell. And media literacy, the point that was being made about sort of the shrinking of democracy. If you look at some of the recent elections, actually in, in Europe and in the United States, when the idea is we should the government should not be involved in telling in telling parents what the schools are going to teach, something like that. And so it, it seems to rest, that argument seems to rest on the premise that parents know better than anybody else, but the parents are often the ones who are media illiterate. And, and so it, it again is gonna be a difficult sell when there's this whole, uh, I mean, the, the emphasis in the United States involves education related to race. Uh, but I think it could also become an obstacle 
when the media education is related to disinformation and just honesty. And we see that uh, even today in the news reports, there are stories about um, disinformation regarding COVID, disinformation regarding this latest variant. And people are gonna die because of that disinformation. They're not gonna get booster shots. And that, that becomes a, a significant issue. So put on your armor when you, want, when you go forth on this crusade to, uh, to try to, to get this, this message across. Yes. Um, thank you for that. Uh, here's my armor. <laughs> <laughs> we are armed. So uh, let's go back to the slideshow. And the next slide. Um, you just heard from Professor Sieb and this next part, uh, I relied heavily on a book that he recently published that I highly recommend. It's called The Information of War at War. It covers... Um, uh, information war journalism, disinformation, and model, modern warfare. It brings up concepts about the fact that war outcomes are determined more by more than just bullets and bombs, the weaponization and militarization of information, and um, this idea that in the future a great part of warfare may be fought via information rather than traditional combat. Um, it does include a chapter on media literacy uh, and what role media literacy plays now and in the new era. And this book is all uh, under, the foundation of it is a historical contest, um, context that is very, very interesting to, it al allows us to see where we've been and where we are now and where we may be going. So I wanted to say that a lot, I give credit where credit is due. Um, next slide, please. So I'm tying all this to national defense right now. And um, much of war, if not all of war, is about power. Um, and there are different kinds of power. So I'm just going to go over uh, the, you know, there are others, but these basic concepts. Soft power is the power of attraction versus persuasion and coercion. So it is shaping the preference of others through appeal and attraction versus coercion through what was traditionally thought of as military actions. This is where a lot of public diplomacy lies in this power of attraction. Um, what makes a country attractive to come up with a simple example why do people want to buy Italian suits and German cars? Uh, these, this is not something that is coerced. You're not forced to think that way. But yet these countries have, through their actions and their promotions, created a, a power of attraction. So that's basically soft power. Hard power is the use of financial incentives or military strength to influence the behavior of other entities. That's where traditionally we think of where the military lies. Smart power is a strategic combination of soft power and hard power. It stresses a very strong military, but also uses um, soft power uh, ideas like forming alliances and partnerships. Um, so it's really that combination of using both soft power and hard power intelligently. And sharp power is, um, that's come out in a newer, that's a newer uh, idea uh, and it's controversial. Some people don't really think that that belongs in this same thing, but I think in, in what we're talking about, it, uh, it has a place. Sharp power is the piercing or penetrating of the information environment uh, of a target audience by manipulating or distorting information that reaches them. Um, this can include efforts at censorship, the use of manipulation to reduce the integrity of independent institutions and creating kind of what Kim was talking about, this lack of trust. Um, 
Often this will take advantage of some asymmetry between free and unfree systems. It is where authoritarian regimes uh, both limit free expression and distort political environments in other democracies. So they're shielding their own domestic po population at the same time influencing more free countries abroad. An example of that is China and Russia have tried to manipulate or co-op culture, education systems and media to influence democracies. And next slide, please. So in media literacy, we talk a lot about representation. And uh, it's really a core foundation of media literacy is understanding that media is a representation of what it is showing, writing about, uh, creating images of. It is not that entity itself. So I'm gonna talk just a few moments about the media representation of war. Media has an enormous power to determine whether or not publics are in support of wars. Um, just to give a brief historical outline, in the 1940s, World War, in World War II, there was radio. And Edward Murrow told stories in real time from the battle zones, which influenced public opinion in the US about what entering the war effort, it broke down or helped to break down that isolationist, isolationism that was common in the United States at the time because those graphic words and sounds stirred the emotions and the intellectual thinking of the American public. Um, in the 1960s, sometimes the Vietnam War was called the living room war. Um, because about 90% of US households at that point had televisions. And that reduced, it reduced that space between battlefield and the viewer. Seeing and hearing these seemingly endless war, graphic grisly images, pessimistic reports from the media and from those that they interview, it, that is part of what gives rise to doubt over official policies. Um, in the 1990s, the, what is called the CNN effect, some of you may or some of you may not have heard that term. And it's the theory that continuous coverage of major events on TV can influence domestic and foreign policy making agendas. And what's different from, you know, in the 1960s, you had to wait until the five or six o'clock news to get the information where once these 24 hour news cycle um, uh, stations came out like CNN, it was a complete bombardment. You could watch it 24 hours live in real time at almost, if not any time of the day. Um, this molds public opinion and it can shape policymakers' decisions. The CNN effect had influence in the US invasions in Somalia, in Bosnia, in Kosovo. And these TV reports helped set the agenda at times because officials in the Bush and Clinton administrations had to react quickly um, to events that were dominating newscasts. And the 2000, in the 2000s, we had the, the Twitter effect. That's when we can say war goes viral. And the difference is, as we know, with all of the radio, the television, 24 hour news cycle, there were still gatekeepers. There were editors. There were people deciding what is newsworthy. Um, but in recent years, reports can come from anyone at any time, straight from the battlefield to be seen all over the world. Um, all eyes on ISIS, hashtag all, all eyes on ISIS in 2014, essentially announced the invasion of Northern Iraq. And social media has of course empowered ISIS recruiting for over a hundred countries. ISIS is, what their name, they're not a country, it's a non-state actor. 
and social media was the vehicle ISIS used to declare war on the United States. The execution of journalist James Foley, that was deliberately designed for viral distribution. So that is the new era we're in. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna look forward a little bit. Um, military information support operations are what are an area where the military is, it exists and they're planning on expansion. The obje objective is to convince the enemy um, as well as neutral and friendly nations and forces to take actions favorable to the United States and its, I and its allies. Um, I'm gonna take from Dr. Sieb's book, General Richard D. Clark, Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command recently said, great power competition is about influence. And uh, there is in the U.S. military a plan for expansion of this. They are planned operations to convey selected information to foreign audiences that influence emotions, motives, objectives, and reasoning and ultimately the behavior of foreign governments, organizations, and individuals that in a manner that is favorable. So essentially military information support operations is a nonviolent force multiplier that is used within violent environments. It is persuading versus compelling. It relies on mental and emotional factors to promote specific behaviors, thinking, and action. Um, it's going to rely heavily on experts who understand the subtleties of political, cultural, ethnic, and religious aspects, um, as well as uh, what we what I said was the foundation of, me, of uh, public diplomacy, which is listening to foreign pub publics through social media and, and analytics. Um, and it, it, this is interesting because it raises some questions that, you know, I'm not sure we have answers for right now. A lot of this is really soft power activity in the hands of an entity that is traditionally known for hard power. So it's interesting how this is coming together. Um, I want to, before we go to break it, I just want to see some of these seems like companies like Facebook are already uh, engaging in sharp power from Jeff. That's true. Yanti, especially with the social power they have, adjusting the algorithm as well as the financial power with cryptocurrency they're getting into. And from John Pettis, the US is less able to implement defensive sharp power compared to say China's great firewall due to the First Amendment. So we're even more reliant on education to lift up our population's resistance and inform the attack and in, to information attack. The problem is we barely teach any functional media literacy or critical thinking. So our population is easily manipulated. So true. Media from Felix has often been used for these purposes. Um, there's a film of Teddy Roosevelt and his rough riders fighting in Spain over his policies in Cuba. Yes, a lot of this is not new. It's been amplified with our new information tools. Um, so I, I wanna leave enough time for our breakout groups. So the next, if you'll go to the next slide, then maybe we'll, if we have time, we'll go over some more of these comments, they're great. What role do you see media literacy playing? in a new era of increased combat via information, persuasion, and listening. So we're going to give, what, 10 minutes for that? Uh, yeah. Are uh, we close? Eight, eight minutes, so we eight have minutes. time at the end. Okay. Eight minutes. So almost the same groups. I just uh, change a little bit. So, um, but here we go. So eight minutes. Okay. See you in eight minutes.
Um, any of you, if you want to get to a breakout room and you cannot, just let me know. Um, if not, you can wait and everybody will be back in seven minutes. Hey Salome, can you hear me? Yes, Yanti. Hi. Hey, was there a specific room you want to be at? Um, actually, I was on my way back to home, so I'm really confused. I just joined just to catch some final <laughs> words <laughs> and ideas. Yeah, yeah. So We're... maybe I'm gonna stay here and I'll okay. just listen. No problem. Are you doing any better? <laughs> Mm, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. I'm just working and keeping myself busy, so it helps. Okay, but at least you, you personally asking. healthy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it's it's physically, hard I'm to just keep. asking physically. <laughs> yeah, physically, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people around me they have COVID, but I'm I already had my <laughs> my portion of COVID, so I'm I'm done with that. Yeah, everybody's very afraid. It seems like it's uh... it's spreading fast. Yeah. So, and your mom? Uh, she's doing well. Yeah, she she's also okay. She's also working, and it just helps her. But my grandparents have COVID now, so we are monitoring their health now. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> be strong but thank you for asking sure thank you for your email i didn't have a chance even to reply it's been crazy here yeah it's okay <laughs> I, I know you're busy so your parents are still there yeah for good. A month. that's good no. yeah it's really bad time for me because typically this is time when i go back from work to home and i'm either in the subway or in the bus so it always um, kind of it's a barrier for me to join some meetings in the well, US. There's going to be a recording. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's what I'm hoping Not the breakout for. rooms, but the, the actual full thing. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to see what should be the next step with, you know, uh, media literacy as public diplomacy, like what people would want. So. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's a really nice series of uh, talks. Um, yeah, very um, connected with what you're interested in. Sorry, say again. I said it's very connected with the work that you're doing and what you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, it is. And I'm really big fan of Michelle. I don't know if you remember that we uh, uh, we became really I mean, I wouldn't say friends, we've never met, but we talk maybe once a month uh, just to check on each other and ask um, so what we are doing in media literacy. So I, I just, I was trying to be here today, but Michelle, still, I was talking about Mich Michelle Johnson. 
Michel Tenon? Is it a... Oh, Johnson. Sorry, it's it's Johnson. Yeah, it's Johnson. The one who is uh, leading today's session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michel, Michel yeah, Johnson. yeah, it's Michel Johnson. Oh, okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, so I was I was trying to be here, but okay. I was not able. But I will watch recording and maybe send some few words after that. Sounds great. Yeah, I give them warning in like two minutes. I'm gonna bring everybody back. Okay. Cool. So work-wise, everything's fine. Um. Yeah, we are kind of uh, summarizing everything we are doing here in podcast in. You know the media literacy project i'm leading and i am already thinking of planning or doing something different from february like offering some programs in media literacy so because we are um, kind of summarizing these projects uh, in february this will be the end of the projects okay. uh, but yeah i think everything is going well i learned a lot of things and um, yeah are you still planning on coming yeah, I'm coming in December, and um, yeah, this December will be a very days, tough so. visit, but we'll see how it goes. Keep us posted. Lisa knows about this, but <laughs> I will update you. <laughs> Sounds good. And Lisa can <laughs> as well. Oh, people will join us right now, and we'll continue the um, um, just the wrapping up. I guess people are not coming back because they're very immersed into the discussion so which is a good yeah thing. Mm. wow really nobody wants to come back <laughs> is Rene here as well or it's just I think he was in from the media okay so So this time is exactly like transition between work to back home. It's like early evening. Yeah, that, yeah, it's 9 p.m. here, so. Okay. Okay. So it seems like nobody wanted to get out of their breakout room and they needed to yank you out like with the Zoom uh, more. So that's a good sign. Uh, but we do have like uh, five more minutes. So Michelle, <laughs> your microphone, we cannot hear you. Yeah, I, I wish we had more time because I want to hear uh, what the group spoke about. But uh, my group, uh, uh, one high school teacher brought up such a, an, an interesting topic that they were teaching children right now media literacy, let's say, more than in the past. This is, of course, United States focused. Um, but what about people who are out of the education system. What about adults? What role does media literacy have there? Um, because it's going to be 40 years before we have a media literate public who's voting and making decisions and, and putting out uh, content. And we talked about ways to engage uh, uh, adults. Somebody called it the Sesame Street for adults and uh, possibly through games, possibly through movies. But I think that that was such a great point. I wish I could hear from all of you. Uh, three more minutes. So um, there is so much online and I hope that maybe we can keep the comments so that we can share them afterwards. Does anyone have any final, it's 9.57, like 90 second thing that they'd like to say about this? John? So I arrived late, which is the tragedy of all tragedies, especially because my message is, when can we talk about this again? Because it is um, not going away. This problem is only going to become bigger and bigger, both domestically and as a national security issue, which is hard to believe if you spend all your time in it like I do. But it, it's it literally will only eat more and more of the attention pie of national security and also domestic politics and problem resolution. And so I think more convenings like this among people who are thinking and, and building solutions are in order.
It's my final so message. I want I want to invite you and everybody else for the you know two minutes that were left in the chat. So the recording will be available, but also in the chat since this is the not culminating, but the third last of the series that we we planned. But we want to hear from you, and if you want to provide in the chat some feedback for us, and obviously via email to any of us, what would be helpful? to continue in the new year from your perspective? Is it those kind of webinar? Is it a different way of engaging? What do you think moving forward would be something that you would like to engage in? So it would be helpful for us after having those three amazing um, talks, what should be next? And Tessa, also, I want to hear from you um, before Michelle closes. You're muted. <laughs> Well, first of all, I would really like to thank everyone for participating. I think we've just had um, wonderful participation, great and insightful comments, um, a wide variety of perspectives, which of course is so important with a topic like this. And um, I know Monica Hanley and Michelle Johnson, um, you know, who have both given presentations as well as myself, uh, it's, it's actually just been a real privilege to share about this topic because it's one that isn't often addressed in media literacy circles. And in fact, uh, when we first started talking about it, it was kind of like, well, how, how does media literacy even fit with defense? And so given um, how important a topic this is, and especially with the recognition that media literacy is just beginning really to get with policymakers, um, I think it's all the more important that all of us in the practitioner community really understand what high stakes these are and that we have a true contribution that we can make and uh, that our community really has something so valuable to offer that, that truly others don't in the education sphere. And so I, I would really like to encourage all of you to uh, continue to follow these issues. And, and um, I know that uh, our team at the Center for Media Literacy will, the Media Education Lab has been fantastic in sponsoring these um, uh, webinars and working with us on this topic. And I know they're interested. So, you know, I think we've, I think we've gotten a ball rolling and that's exciting. Michelle, any closing? Uh, and I, just, I, I put I put the link uh, for this, where this recording of this one will be, and I'll put the recording of the other two uh, presentation uh, as Michelle is closing. I just want to thank everybody for participating, for your insights and for your concerns and everything that you raised, um, especially my, my little group came up with such great insights. Um, and it was a pleasure. I hope you... Um, Got some insights about public diplomacy and where media literacy uh, fits and can benefit that uh, and your role in that. So, so um, feel free to reach out with, to me if you ever have questions on Um So last to just uh, explain, I, I looked at the link. We didn't uh, put the recording yet there. I think the best we would do a designated one page so you don't need to go between pages and find all the recording and we'll send to all the participants uh, that register, we have the email from the registration, we'll send you the link for that designated page that will allow us to continue the conversation and and get you posted about where do we go from here um, in January. Um, so again, thank you very, very much. We appreciate and we look forward to those collaboration between the Center for Media Literacy and the Media Education Lab. Um, have a great day, evening, night, morning, wherever you are. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good week, everyone.